Good morning. How is everybody? Is it warm enough for you? Yes, better today. Thank you, Okay, I really want to get into this. Um, we're in Romans chapter 12. Romans, again, is the greatest theological book in the entire Bible. You need to understand the book of Romans. You need to understand the flow of the book of Romans. In chapter 12, Paul begins to get into practical matters. What does it mean to be a Christian? How does one live as a Christian? And he starts off by focusing in on the church. And he tells us in Romans chapter 12 that God has given to each member of the church a spiritual gift, prayer. Most of them need prayer for some physical illness or disease. You understand that? So, let's just go over the scripture. Uh, we're going to talk today on the gifts of healing. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 12. I like to always put things in context. Never take a particular verse out of context. In a dialogue, he told her that he had water that if she drank of, she would never thirst again. She said, I want that water. So I don't have to keep coming back to this well. Jesus tells her, go get your husband, come back. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, you're right when you say you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. So you're right when you say you have no husband. Which brings a little side thing. People in the church who say you can live together in common law, and according to the common law of the state, in the state of Colorado, can be considered married. Bunk. Jesus says, the man you're living with now is not your husband. Just living in, together with somebody doesn't make them spouses. Do you all understand that? I don't want moving faith. And I gave you the real world example. <clears throat> a friend of mine, a brother, when I was in Fowler, he was in Ordway. And... Southeast Colorado was going through a drought. It had been four or five years of drought. A lot of farmers and ranchers lost their farms and ranches. A lot of cows had to be sold because there wasn't any grain in the field. There wasn't anything to grow. The grass, it was withered. The cost of, of uh, bales of hay was way too expensive. So a lot of ranchers had to sell their cattle and my brother went out to a rancher's house, asked him if he could pray for rain. And the guy thought he was crazy. He said, yeah, whatever, go ahead. So he walked out in the field and prayed, and several hours later, the rain came. And something I didn't tell those of you who are here about that, and I, I, the Lord brought it to mind, or I remembered afterwards. He asked the rancher, how much rain should I pray for? And, the, and, of course, the rancher didn't believe him, didn't believe this was going to happen. So he threw out a figure, oh, two inches. It rained two and a half inches. So <clears throat> that gives you some idea. It was just phenomenal. That brother has the gift of faith. It's mountain-moving faith. It can do amazing things if you will believe. So today, to learn the gifts of healing by, this, by that one spirit. So... I'm going to teach you a lot in a very short time on healing today. There's much, much more you need to learn in God's Word. But we do not believe, nor do we teach the name. I have a relative. Hello? No. No? Well, then apparently we still need these ministries, don't we? They were given until we reach the unity of the faith. When is that going to happen? That won't happen until Jesus comes back. Until we reach the full maturity, that's not going to happen until Jesus comes back. We're going to grow. we're supposed to be growing and growing and growing. We're not even after two thousand years. We are more divided than ever before. That's the truth. You got Catholics against Protestants. You got Baptists against Pentecostals. You got this against that. It's just sad. I don't see any unity. Just my opinion. I do not see. Any unity, do you? Hello? Hello? Give me your honest opinion. I mean, I just don't see it. I think we still need these gifts and ministries, don't you? Yes. Okay. Chris, you all 
Grab your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Just one verse. This is it. I don't want to exhaust you all. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. Chris, have you got it? Yeah. Okay, read 1 Corinthians 1, 7. So that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Paul is writing again, remember, to the church at Corinth. They had all these problems. He goes through three chapters to explain to this church the use of the gifts, how they're to operate, how people are to interact with one another, how they're to be used to bless the other members of the body. Three whole chapters. But he starts off in the very first chapter, and he tells this church, y'all, y'all as a church are not lacking in any of these spiritual gifts. What does it say? As you what? Look at your Bibles. Look at, listen, to, listen to Chris. As you what? Wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Has Jesus Christ come back yet? No. Has he been revealed to us? No. Then apparently we still need these gifts. You're not, let me put it in today's 2022. Let it be from Brother God to you by way of St. Paul and First Corinthians. Y'all are not lacking any gift as you wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. We said, hello? How many people are suffering in this church and other churches because we're not exercising these gifts? But there are plenty of others we could use. I'm not going to have them read it. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 10. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Malachi, Old Testament, 3, 6. Hebrews 13, 8. Lots of places in the Word it says that God has given us these gifts for a reason. And they are to be used until the Lord returns. <sighs> but... Pentecostals, on the other hand, are equally wrong by assuming that they can exercise whatever gift they want at any time. No, 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 no. This man is given a spiritual gift. This woman is given a spiritual gift. But he can't exercise her gift any time that he wants to, and she can't exercise his gift any time that she wants to. As a matter of fact, all you can do is exercise your own gift. And even then, you have to trust God to empower that prayer or that action or whatever. You have to trust God. You know what that means? He can't brag about whatever gift he has because it's up to God to act through him using that particular gift. It's up to God to act through her with whatever gift she's got. It's not up to you, really. In other words, <clears throat> if I had the gift of healing, and this young lady needed a physical healing, and I had the gift of healing, all I can do is pray for her. Do I have any magical power to heal her? Shake your head, no. no. It's not magic. I've got the gift of healing, but it's up to the Holy Spirit to act on my request. God is sovereign. That means he's king. He's a sovereign. That's in French. He's king. He does what he wills to do. God is sovereign. He determines when and where the spirit will move in revival. And when any church, including this church, any church, starts exercising the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it's because the Holy Spirit has decided that He's going to revive, start a revival. And it's going to start in whatever church, that church, this church, and it's going to spread out from there. And if you're not, and you don't understand, go home. Get on the internet. Go to Google. And, and look up the great revival. The Great Awakening. Look it up. It's in, it's in a secular Wikipedia. The Great Awakening, 1740s, the United States, Great Britain, Europe, the Great Awakening. It was a revival of the Holy Spirit. And it is so
so real, people, that in a secular sight, they talk about it because they can't deny the history. There was a real spiritual revival. The gift of healing is designed especially to meet the what needs? The physical needs of the people of God. We need to remember that all healing, whether spiritual or physical, flows from the cross. It is only because of what the Lord Jesus did for us that any of us are healed of anything. Isaiah 53. Let's read it very quickly. The He is Jesus. Isaiah 750 years before Jesus was born. Surely He took up, took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered Him stricken by God, smitten by Him, and afflicted. But He was pierced. Remember? Here, through the feet, through the side. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And then Isaiah says, what? And by his wounds, and by his wounds, we are healed. And Peter will quote that in 1 Peter chapter 2. However, we need to keep in mind that all healing occurs only according to the will of the Spirit of God. I said before, I want you to see it again. We cannot demand that God heal us or anyone else. Who, are, who am I? Who are you? I'll tell you who we are. King David, the prophet, writing in the book of Psalms, says, Lord, I'm a worm and not a man. He got it right. We're little, itty bitty worms compared to God. How dare a worm demand anything of the creator of the universe? We can't demand anything of the Lord. I don't suggest anybody demand anything of God. We cannot demand that God heal us or anyone else. He may heal, he may not heal. According to whose sovereign will? Yes. You all understand this? Who's in charge? Who can do whatever he wants to? Yeah, God and only God. Do you understand we are supplicants to God? To be a supplicant means we, we are dependent on God. Do you understand, really, that every breath you draw is upon the grace of God? You're sitting here today because of God's mercy and grace toward you. That's the truth. We need God. God does not need us. You all understand that? We need, to be, we need to be humble. We need to be thanking God for every good thing that we have. And if we have a need, and, and a lot of us have needs, if we have a need, we need to go on bended knee as a supplicant asking the creator of the universe, Lord, you can do anything. You can do anything. You spoke and created the entire universe. That means you can do anything. But I need some help. There you go. Even in the book of Acts, where the apostles heal many, we see this truth that we cannot demand anything, that we have to depend on God. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul had an affliction. The Apostle Paul, the greatest of the Apostles. I call him the greatest because Paul traveled more miles, started more churches, presented the Gospels not only to the Jewish people, but to the Gentiles for more than 30 years. But Paul had an affliction. The theologians will argue and debate about what that affliction was. I believe Paul had a disease of the eyes or an affliction of the eyes. And I won't go into the reasons why, but you can go to the book of Galatians and other places. I think he had, his affliction was a problem with his eyesight. Three times. Three times he asked the Lord to heal him. This is the great apostle Paul. 
you are sinful. And Paul explains why. You all get the point I'm making? If the great apostle Paul asked God to heal him, God said no. Who are we to ask God to then expect you can name it and claim that God's got to give it to you? I mean, that's just silly. In Philippians chapter 2, we read about a minister named Epaphroditus who was, quote, sick unto death. Well, one of Paul's traveling companions. Timothy, another of Paul's mentees. Paul was the teacher, he was the student. Timothy suffered from some physical affliction. He had an illness of some, side, some, some kind. So Paul writes to Timothy. Does he say, just name and claim it, Timothy. Just pray the Lord will heal you. Or, I heal you, Timothy, in the name of Jesus. Is that what Paul wrote? Are you ready for this if you don't know it? Paul writes to Timothy, stop drinking only water because of this illness. Stop drinking only water and use a little what? Wine. Wine, because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. In other words, Timothy, use a little medicine. You've got a bunch of stomach issues. Stop drinking just water and drink a little, what's that word? Wine. wine. Anybody know what's in wine? Grapes. Grapes. What else? I'm giving you a hint. What? Alcohol. Yeah, alcohol kills bugs and bacteria and lots of other things. And alcohol apparently will settle the stomach. And you know, but you got a bunch of stomach problems. Stop drinking only water. Drink a little wine for your frequent illnesses. But you know what Paul didn't say? I hear you in the name of Jesus. And Paul did have to get to healing. He was an apostle. He brought people back from the dead. <clears throat> but he tells Timothy, here's a little wine. So, in effect, Paul is telling Timothy to use medicine for his illnesses. In fact, if you don't use medicine today, you're questioning the divine order of things, and you're bringing unnecessary suffering on yourself and others. I cannot stress this enough. Do I believe in miraculous healings? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've seen it. Absolutely. Do I believe in medicine? Absolutely. God looked down the quarter of time, and he tells us that the bulk of humanity in every age is going to be unbelieving. Let me say that again. God looked down the quarter of time and he saw that in every single age, the bulk, the vast majority of humans are not going to be Christian. They're going to be pagans. They're going to be rebels against God. So did God say, hmm, let the little miscreants, the little rebels suffer? No. In his mercy, since they're not going to come to church, since they're not going to join the body of believers, God gives the increase of knowledge in science and medicine to help alleviate the pain and suffering of people in the world. It is a gift from God, even to the unbelievers. Do you all understand that? I hope you all understand that because people think that we Christian pastors, we're radicals, and we, we teach faith and, and not medicine, and we're against science, and we're... Uh, that's just ignorance on the part of the world. But it's not going to be ignorance on our part. I believe in healing. I do believe in miracles. But I also believe that God has given medicine to fill in the gaps. Does that make sense? Use both. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul wrote, I left Trophimus, I left Trophimus what? Sexually. What? Sexually. If the Apostle Paul left one of his companions sick in Miletus, what does that tell you? Hello? Doesn't that tell you?
tell you that even the great apostle Paul didn't have the gift of healing to give as he, whenever he wanted to? If, if this is Trophima, here's Trophimus. <laughs> Hi, Trophimus. If Trophimus is in my leaders and he's sick, and Paul, the great apostle, the greatest in my opinion, we can debate that, but the greatest of the apostles, I've got to go to another city, but Trophimus is sick. Before I leave, I'm going to pray and have Lord heal you. Doesn't that make sense? But Paul says, I left him what? So apparently, even though Paul had the gift of healing, all he can do is pray for Trophimus and then wait and see what the Lord does. Does this make sense? Just as in the days of the apostles, those who have the gift today of healing cannot heal people at will. You have the gift to heal Carol Brown. If Carol Brown has the gift of healing, Carol Brown doesn't have to worry. You don't have to worry if you have this gift. Well, what if I lay hands on somebody and pray for somebody that the Lord heal them and it doesn't happen? So, it's, again, it's not up to you. It's up to you to be faithful to exercise your gift. It's up to God what He's going to do with it. Do you understand? What she has to do, or what you have to do, if you've been given this gift, is you need to exercise it and be praying, laying hands on people and praying and asking God to heal them. That's all she has to do if she's got this gift. She doesn't have to feel bad if they're not healed immediately, or not healed even at all. It's not up to her. Who is it up to? Say it again. It's up to God. But whoever you are, if you've got this gift, you need to start exercising it. And if you think you might have this gift, hey, start exercising anyway. It can't hurt. We should be doing that anyway. Why do you think Chad stands up here every morning on Sunday? And let's see, just a few announcements today. Uh, keep praying for Charlotte. Keep praying for him. Why does he do that? Do you think it might be because Chad is telling us who in the church needs help and that we should be praying for them? Yes. Hello? Yes. We all should be doing this anyway. Yes? Yes. Praying for one another. I urge all of you, if you have a disease or an illness, to use both What's that say? Medicine and prayer. There you go. Doesn't that sound, sound commonsensical? Yes. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Use what's up here, people. If God has given medicine, we're going to use medicine. But God also gives to us, those who believe in Him, faith. So we pray and we ask God, Lord, you can do, you can do what others cannot do. You can do even more than man's medicine can do. Yes? Please, Lord, show mercy. Not all healing takes place instantaneously. For example, you read in Luke chapter 17. As Jesus entered a certain village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. Were they instantly healed right then? No. No, they weren't. But we read, And as they went, they were what? Yes. Cleansed of their leprosy. Sometimes it takes more than just one laying on of hands. Sometimes it takes continuous prayer. Let's try it again again. You want to prove? Let's read. Hey, we're going to talk about a blind man. <clears throat> Jesus brought this blind man out of the village. And after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands upon him, Jesus asked this man, 
Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Huh? Does that sound normal to you? Hello? What's that kind of telling you? Well, I can see something now. The people look like, they look like trees walking around. So, what did Jesus do? Then again, Jesus laid his hands on the man, on the man's eyes. Did you notice that? Again? Did you all notice that? Again? Yes. Again, the second time, Jesus laid his hands on the man's eyes. Then, the man's eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clear. But do you get the point I'm making here on this? It took more than one laying on of hands. Do you all get the point? Yes? No? Yes, yes. Among the eldership in this church and in every church, among the eldership at least one has the gift of healing. How do I know? Read James chapter 5. Is anyone among you what? Sick. Sick. He should call the who? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise him up. Man, I got a problem, I got a medical issue. So I asked the elders to pray over me. All they have to do is what the scripture says. Anoint me with oil and ask the Lord to heal me. It's up to God to do what he's going to do when he's going to do it. But it's my job to do what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to go ask the elders. Do you understand that? And the prayer offered in faith hmm, will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. Now, I want you to notice this next thing that James says. It's part of James 5. Very next verse. What's it say? If he's what? What will happen? Sometimes, not always, but some, sometimes, sometimes our sickness is a result of sin. Sometimes. We need to understand that. Not always. Remember, Jesus and his disciples are walking along in Jerusalem, and they see a man who's blind. The man has been blind since birth. He was born blind. And so the disciples logically ask him, Teacher, <clears throat> who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Remember what Jesus said? Yeah. Neither. Neither. This man is blind not because he sinned and not because his parents sinned, but that the glory of God would be made manifest, not only in his life, but others. Why? Because I'm going to heal him. I'm going to do what's never been done in the history of the world. I'm going to heal a man who was born blind. So I'm not saying that if you have an illness, it's because you have sinned. What I am saying is, if you have an illness because you have sinned, not only will you be healed, according to James 5, but your sin will be forgiven as well. Or we can put it another way. You need to pray and ask the Lord to forgive your sins, even before you go talk to the elders. Does that make sense? And don't feel guilty. We're all sinners. Yes. Right, Darcy. We're all sinners. Lord, if I've done something that has caused my blindness, then Lord, I just I ask your forgiveness. See, that's not hard to do. There is much to learn about the gift of healing people. 
The person given this gift should study the Word of God, but carefully. Why? I like this. This is today's verse. So that in all things, who may be glorified? God may be glorified. So that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory forever and ever. Amen. Since I used it before, I'll use it again. <clears throat> if Carol Brown has been given the gift of healing, and she prays for Doris because Doris has a physical illness, and Doris is healed, can Carol Brown go around patting herself on the back, saying what a great, how great she is? Who do we get the glory to? I thank you, Lord God, that you gave me the gift of healing so that I could use it to help Sister Doris. Amen? Does that make sense? Yes. That, doesn't this all make very good sense? When you just read it in the context, you say, wow, this is amazing. What's amazing to me is that every single person that I can look at, all I can see are general bodies. <laughs> that every body that I can look at has been given a spiritual gift to you for the rest of us. <clears throat> and you know what? This is one time when I really swoop. I want to know. Don't you? Yes. Hello? Chris, don't you? Wouldn't you like to know what gifts we all have? Please, people. Please. Spend even just a little bit of time asking God the Father to show you what gift the Holy Spirit has given you. Spend just a little, I'm just I'm begging you, please spend just a little bit of time. Please, Father God, would you show me what gift you've given to me? And then wait, because he'll not only tell you if you just keep asking, he'll confirm it in the mouth of somebody else so you know that it was God and not your own imagination. And then you can start exercising that gift. Does that make sense? So that who may be glorified? that God may be glorified. Boy, does the church need these gifts today, yes? Yes. yes. All right, stand up. <clears throat> we need these gifts. And I'll tell you, every single gift that I've talked about up to this point, wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, I wish I had them all. I did. I do. I wish I had any one of them. Paul starts off with these gifts, and I get to this one. Every time I get to the gift of healing, I wish I had been given it. Because to me, that's a cool gift. Wouldn't that be cool? He's given it to one of you. Father, I thank you that you gave us these gifts. Until we reach the unity of the faith, Father, until the church can come together in unity, until we reach the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. We, we haven't arrived there yet, Father. And, and Father, you said that we're not lacking any gift as we await the return or the revealing, the revelation of Jesus Christ. He hasn't been revealed to the world yet, Lord. He has not come in the clouds with the armies of heaven. So we still have these gifts but we're just not operating in them. Lord God, Father, Lord God, Son, Lord God, Holy Spirit.